Um, this lecture follows a most memorable, memorable and stirring occasion to endorse Anton Cordial, epitomized by the restoration of Hague's statue. That statue is a poignant Anglo-French symbol of our shared endeavors in times of war, when our joint liberties have been under threat from malign forces. As Monsieur Bruno, Bruno Bertua, the former mayor, stated, Montreal Samir was surprised to find itself at the heart of the British Army's military machine between 1916 and 1990. How curious indeed it was for this charming medieval town to become the nerve center of the Allied planning of the ultimate defeat of the German forces. Life in Hague's GHQ was described by, by my great-grandfather, Sir Frank Fox, under the nom de plume GSO, and serving officers were not allowed to write under their true names. No remote relation was he for me. Few people are lucky enough to know their great-grandfather. I knew him well. I was 15 when he died, and he was my childhood hero. As his literary executor, I have taken enormous pleasure in republishing three of his World War I related books, all of which can be bought, I hope, after this lecture. Let me tell you something about him. Fox was a remarkable man. Having first experienced battle in, as the Morning Post war correspondent in the Balkan Wars, he was in Belgium in August 1914 to report the German invasion. So horrified was Fox by the atrocities meted out to the civilian population, the first use of zeppelins for air warfare, and the destruction of historical buildings that he was determined to become a competent. During hostilities, he had become close to King Albert, who invested him with the Order of the Crown and awarded him the Belgian Military Cross. Commissioned over age in the British Army, he was twice wounded and was sent to the Commonwealth in England. Whilst there, he worked in MI7 propaganda, writing to encourage the US to enter the fight. He then pulled strings to get back to France and was posted to the Quartermaster General's Department. He must be quite a sight, missing half his right foot, having a withered left arm, and on top of his disabilities, being profoundly deaf from shell fire. I'm not surprised that no photographs of him in uniform survive. <laughs> he was awarded the OBE military and was mentioned in the dispatches. Some staff officers were criticized for being desk warriors, far from the front. At least he was immune from such remarks. Indeed, it seems from his account that many staff officers were, in his own words, cropped, having taken a knock. Fox appreciated regular physiotherapy for his wounds at the hospital, which is now the Hermitage home, the Hotel, where some of you may be staying. But enough of him at the moment. What did he record of life here uh, from 1916 to 19, when Montreux was the hub of the most extraordinary planning and logistical exercise, leading up to the final defeat of the German army? I hope you'll read for yourselves. However, I will pick up one or two points. Montreux was selected for its all-important role owing to its, uh, its accessibility both to the trenches and to Paris and to London. GHQ was moved here from Sonoma in March 1916. The British Expeditionary Force, BEF, were paid as its Commander-in-Chief to thus communicate with ease with the Secretary of State for War and the government in London. Fox describes its attributes as, quote, central remoteness. There was a military population of up to a maximum of 5,000, including 300 regular officers, supplemented by temporary officers, referred to irreverently by some as temporary gentlemen. This is the officer's mess. Um, the building on the left is now, I think, the Music Academy. Uh, the wall has disappeared. Um, the, uh, that, that was where um, the officers obviously lived. The next photograph was the one uh, of the Col Militaire, which was where the GHQ was based. A very fine building, and unfortunately it's been demolished. And, and in more enlightened days, it would have had a 
a blue plaque or whatever, uh, however the French um, were in such buildings. Pop says uh, the life here was, quote, a fantastic life, serious, monkish, in the almost total absence of the female sex, sober, disciplined, and exciting. Typical hours worked from 9 in the morning till 10.30 at night, with no distinction for weekends. Leave was given only every six months. It's curious that he uses this last adjective, exciting, as elsewhere, in contrast, he describes life in the trenches as, quote, tedious, with only rapid moments of high excitement and horror. General Travis Clark, the distinguished quartermaster general under whom Fox served, was insistent that staff work should be seamless between the office and the trenches. Despite the difference in rank, although they were close in age, Travis Clark and Fox became close friends. Very odd, I mean, the lieutenant general and the captain. And in, this, in the remarkable game book of statistics, which I have republished for the first ever time as an appendix of the GHQ book, it is inscribed to Fox from Travis Clark, quote, from his sincere friend. They worked together later in peacetime, staging the British Empire exhibition. I recently had the pleasure of presenting a copy of GHQ to Travis Clark's son, John. Now, there is a 98 year old. John Travis Clark, and I'm sure he's with us a spirit. I, I have the greatest pleasure when I go back to London to tell him that we, we gave the lecture and the uh, uh, book commemorating his father and his age, but also um, was well received here. Five British divisions were deployed, each of 20,000 men, larger than the standard. Perhaps the most significant statistic was that for every rifleman or gunner in the front line, there were three soldiers in support. I say British, but let us not forget that this included men from throughout the British Empire, let alone brave soldiers from France, of course, Belgium, United States, Italy and Portugal. An early and truly international headquarters had missions here, and we'll try and see if we get that map back. No, there we are. No, it's a fascinating map because it shows throughout the time how the various missions were spread and, <coughs> and the key, key buildings. Um, but I can't find any reference to the Belgian and Portuguese missions so that, that must have been here. Uh, but uh, the other nationalities <coughs> are represented in this slide. So, what were the main headline functions of GHQ? It was the link between the army and the field and the political leaders of the Allies, formulating strategy in the British sector in order to deliver one of the most complex logistical exercises of all time. By the end of 1918, the British Army consisted of no less than 3.8 million men. The Quartermaster General's role involved no less than 17 directorates and five inspectorates. Supply all clothing, food, munitions, and pay, transport by road, by horse, by motor, and by rail and by water, agriculture and food supply, medical, veterinary, and spiritual support, etc., all vital for maintaining morale. Although it was noted by Fox that uh, GHQ officers were poor church goers, in contrast to the very religious aid. Travis Clark was also praised subsequently for his humane handling of German POWs. There was occasional recreation here in this very building, in the theatre, and in sport. Fox particularly enjoyed riding and took a special interest in the welfare of the many horses and mules uh, at the front. Whilst British soldiers were described as, quote, lambs in the trenches, he maintains that they behaved as, quote, labs in the villages. The relationship between the army and the civilian population was a crucial one, being the unusual state of a country being occupied by friendly forces. This required civilian assent and cooperation, which was complicated by the movement of refugees. New insights in the book are given into the importance of a labor corps of up to a third of a million men. 
elderly and disabled French civilians did sterling service. More demanding physical work was carried out by labor companies made up of Indian, Caribbean, Chinese, Fijian, native South African, and Egyptian men, supplemented, of course, by German prisoners of war. I will not go into the descriptions of the waxing and waning of the campaign, all of which you can read elsewhere, but I want to concentrate on the logistics behind the whole operation. The current reassessment of Hague's reputation is supported by this first hand and contemporary record. He has given fulsome praise for his faithfulness to friends, despite political and press criticism, of which he had more than his fair share his brilliant insight for appointments, his religi religious convictions, his great trust in others, and perhaps in a particularly neglected quality, his enlightened promotion of education soldiers to prepare them as better citizens for the return to Civil Street after such an extraordinary and exceptional experience in battle. The book ends with not the plot Bosch's appointment as Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Armies, a move which was wholeheartedly supported by the British and American generals Haig and Pershing, <clears throat> an enlightened demonstration of international cooperation. And I was absolutely delighted to hear that Bosch's uh, was great-grandson was at the ceremony that we just all attended. He wrote to uh, a, a charming letter um, um, praising the relationship that his great-grandfather and Haig had on, on a deeply personal relationship. I think I'm right in saying that uh, when the statue of Foch was, was the statue of Foch outside Victoria Station? Oh, um, I, I believe that uh, that epitomized the relationship that the two of them had. Whilst we all know of the ultimate victory, one only has to visit the serried ranks of graves of the military soldiers to recognize the appalling human cost. Particularly poignant in the description was actually pointed out to me by John Hudson the other day. It read, How beautiful is victory, but how dear is loving wife. Extraordinary moving description. Frank Box accompanied King George and Hague to pay their respects on a small, very small, private visit to the later cemeteries in Belgium and France exactly a century, a century ago, culminating in the etat where many of us will be tomorrow. He recorded this emotive journey, which is accompanied by evocative and unposed photographs in the King's pilgrimage. Next slide, please, which I should be the King's pilgrimage one. And I think it's a lovely portion of the king. All the photographs in, in this book are, are unposed. Um, the Princess Royal came a couple of weeks ago to Etat uh, to celebrate the centenary of this tiny uh, journey of, of the king and, and his private secretary, private staff. Um, with, with no, he, the king just wanted calm reflection and to pay his respects. And uh, we'll, we'll see if you'll find out the part of book. Um, the very, very moving photographs, because they are all unposed. There's um, the book, which is uh, on sale, the coercion of it, um, outside. Um, and it's, I uh, rather like this photograph of Hagen and all of his commanders. Here is a side which uh, is really got nothing to do with military at all. But when I was helping Johnny Astor, I said it'd be rather nice to track the descendants of all um, Hague's commanders. And um, it's, it's an absolute story that of the uh, peerages awarded to uh, his commanders, not every single one is extinct. Quite extraordinary. They were, they may have been marvelous generals, but they were bad breeders, or, <laughs> or bad, bad breeders of, of males, anyway. And uh, I think only, only one peerage uh, went down one generation. And uh, the, the nearest we got uh, was Rawlinson. Uh, Rawlinson didn't have a son, 
that she had inherited from Baron's brother inherited from Baron's on his death, and there is still the uh, Alfred Rawls on his life dead, but that unfortunately was uh, not well enough to come out of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. I would like to um, end this talk with a photograph, because I love this photograph, because I think it epitomizes the close relationship between Hay and Hay and Pot. This also comes up from the book, uh, The King's Pilgrimage. There's no better demonstration, I think, of the Autour Cordial, which we celebrate today. Thank you all very much for coming, and I hope that you might require the box as a memento of what I think you will agree has been a remarkable weekend. Thank you very much.